four points about the emergence of anthropology and the emergence of the specifically U.S. empire. Although we don't always think of the United States as an empire, it really did emerge as the the only empire, you might say, after World War II. Um, and up until chapter 12, up until through chapter 11 of, of uh, Charles King's book, it was mostly about the prelude to this, which was the expansion of the United States into the West taking over places that once belonged to indigenous peoples and Native Americans and Spaniards too, carving heads into stones and mountains in South Dakota for no good reason. Anybody ever been here? Mount Rushmore? How was it? And then you just get in the car and drive back. The oh, yeah. yeah. They have like stands with the, all the different on it. Pretty cool. Yeah. There's another big head, I think they're carving of a Sioux person, chief or something nearby. I've actually been, well, I grew up in Montana, so that's not fair. I was going to say I've been to this place a couple times, but South Dakota, Montana, it's all the same, right? Um, so, you know, at the same time that the United States is expanding into the West and carving heads onto mountainsides, anthropology is building a discipline on the study, basically, of Native Americans. And that's, although Boaz was from Germany and originally studied up in the Arctic and Baffin Island, he would basically make his name and Benedict would make her name and other people in anthropology would make their names by studying Native Americans. And on the one hand, we could say that in a world that was very ethnocentric and very dismissive and very, uh, very down on indigenous peoples and was removing them from their lands, uh, the anthropology voice perhaps was a little bit more sympathetic. But as we've seen, it was also pretty pretty harsh in terms of taking people and putting them in museums and on display and their artifacts and cataloging them and certainly when uh, and not allowing them really to be full anthropologists. So that's the prelude to something that we read about more in these next three chapters. And the first point is how the United States begins not only to take over uh, the West of the Americas, but to expand in different places abroad. And so we've, you know, in uh, what King was is talking about in the uh, Spirit Realms chapter is actually the occupation of Haiti, which the United States occupied between 1915 and 1934, around the same time as uh, occupying the Philippines. Um, different places in which the United States is sort of uh, expanding its reach. That's, I guess, a bit, I don't know if I want to call it ironic, but it's an interesting that uh, it's, it was exactly the Haitian Revolution, the uprising of enslaved and uh, people of, of color in Haiti, uh, the, the only slave revolution that created a new country, a new independent country. Um, and many people believe that there would never have been a, a, uh, a Louisiana purchase without that because Napoleon owned Haiti and he owned that land there. And, and without Haiti and without the riches of the plantations, the sugar plantations, especially from Haiti, it wasn't in his interest to keep trying to have established control over New Orleans and all that French area to the West. And that basically paves the way, although a few people know about it, the Haitian Revolution then paves the way for the westward, westward expansion. And when we look at Haiti today, people also again forget that, you know, we were there, we were, we were in charge of things or wanted to be for a good 20 years, about 100 years ago. 
Um, there were anthropologists who went there, such as uh, uh, King discusses the work of Melville Hertzkowitz, one of the yeah. more famous anthropologists, student of Boaz, uh, wrote a book, did some field work in Haiti during this time, wrote a book, Life in a Haitian Village. There it is, with an introduction by Sidney W. Mintz, who was my professor in graduate school, very famous, probably one of our most famous uh, anthropologist that we have the, studied in Haiti and Jamaica and uh, and in Puerto Rico. Reading him in uh, in uh, the peoples and cultures of Latin America during J term. Uh, so here we have a kind of study of what was going on. Now, on the one hand, it, this was a very a pretty sympathetic study of what was going on in Haiti. And as in contrast to many of the most awful, vile, and racist stereotypes that the United States was, was justifying their expansion on, namely that they were all involved in primitive voodoo magic and all demonic and all those kinds of things, uh, Herskovitz was trying to argue for the humanity of the Haitians and how much a lot of the customs reflected the traditional uh, traditions of Africa, which were uh, very much on display in Haiti. Um, but as King mentions, he really didn't talk about the fact that the United States was there and there's a whole detachment of Marines uh, fighting rebels and making sure everybody was under control. The person who did do more of that was Zora Neale Hurston, who, as we've talked about, became very famous, not necessarily for being an anthropologist, more for being a novelist. And as you can see here, her anthropology of Haiti and Jamaica didn't sell as well as their eyes were watching God, which was really a, an incredible uh, novel. Um, but she talked about the U.S. occupation. And as King points out on page 290, she actually spent four times as much time, a, a four times as much time as Herskovitz did in Haiti. And so it's kind of interesting to me, especially since Sidney Mintz was this big anthropology person to me and was training us in field work. He was really rather dismissive of, at least that I know of, of Zora Neale Hurston's work. He would talk about Herskovitz and other anthropologists. Um, but she actually was doing more extended and perhaps more in-depth field work than Herskovitz had, did, had done. Now, it's hard to say why exactly uh, Zora Neale Hurston was not accepted as an anthropologist. She probably didn't want to be in some ways because she was being, being more successful outside of anthropology and, and writing. Um, but there is still, you know, there her memoir, which King discusses around page 301, or her um, her memoir, autobiographic memoir, uh, gets chopped up by an editor because her deep criticisms of European colonialism were deemed too controversial. Her habit of pointing out the contradiction between American support for national liberation abroad and government-supported racism at home was felt to be ill-timed. So when she wanted to write uh, her, her sort of final memoir, it got, it never really appeared in, in the form that she wanted it to. And uh, her criticisms were, again, deemed too controversial for the United States and perhaps too controversial for anthropology. However, she did get, at least in this edition, she gets an introduction by Maya Angelou. Anybody heard of her? Yes, we have, right? We've probably heard of her a lot more than we have of Sidney Mintz. That will always be the case. So Sidney Mintz can say what he wants. Zora Neale Hurston will be known long after that has all gone away, at least as far as I know. So she does get that kind of recognition, at least now. Uh, as we'll read about in the next chapter, it's a, it's a belated recognition in many ways. Um, but... Again, someone, we have anthropology sort of in general trying to 
critique or argue for the basic humanity of people, but then ending up with these positions, which in some ways don't really answer to the political needs of the time. The second point, uh, which I think is a huge point, which is starting to be recognized now uh, more than it was before, uh, is, you know, this was seen as sort of a controversial idea before, is where Nazi Germany got its idea to put people in these racial boxes and these codes and make people declare themselves and live in certain neighborhoods and have laws about them, they basically copied all of that from the United States. And so when Hitler was rising to power, he was reading about, and their scientists were reading about the eugenics movement in the United States, and they're like, this is a great idea. Well, that's what we need to do. That's what we should be doing. And so this has become perhaps more common knowledge than it was before. I think people uh, not too long ago were perhaps more surprised by this, but they basically took a lot of what they, a lot of what they wanted to do, they borrowed straight from us. And there's our school kids doing the Bellamy salute which was Bellamy was the author of the Pledge of Allegiance, and he originally recommended doing this salute rather than having your hand over your heart, which we did up until 1942 when they said, ah, now nah, let's just do hand over our heart. Let's just kind of forget that one. Let's not do that. And so the second point about American empire is that these ideas about race and about who belongs in the world and nation and what you're supposed to do with flags and who's supposed to live where and marry whom gets exported or copied by other people in different places, not always to the best effect. And, uh, you know, I think it's probably only fair to show that this wasn't just uh, little white kids. This was, uh, here's a classroom in 1939 in Los Angeles, uh, where we have the Bellamy salute going on. It's kind of weird. I don't, I don't want to now ask my grandparents what they were doing. You know, this would have been their, their, their school child experience. I mean, I don't think everybody, I don't think it was as instituted as it is now, actually, it was at the Pledge of Allegiance, but, um, it would be interesting to know uh, what this kind of thing that's been blanked out of our, our memories. So a few pictures of it. At that time, or I mean, around the time of World War II, as King writes on page 317, uh, Ruth Benedict allies with a, an anthropologist there named Jean Weltfish to write a, a pamphlet I just have a copy of this pamphlet. I got it for 25 cents. It was meant to be sold, sold and distributed popularly. So this was something that they were going to give out to everybody in the U.S. Army, for example. Um, and it was called The Races of Mankind. And it was, it was a, basically against the idea and against the predominant racism of the time. And they meant to to sort of write it to, to bolster the war effort against Germany, because despite the fact that the Nazi Germany had copied the US ideas, eventually we decided we didn't like them. And so we were going to fight them and fight against those ideas as well. Now, what was interesting about this is this, this pamphlet was considered too radical. And so it was not distributed uh, within the United States Army because they thought it was too crazy. It was too out there in terms of uh, the ideas that it had about race. And as you, if you read about it in King, you'll read that uh, this got them investigated by the FBI. Uh, it got them a ton of hate mail uh, because people, well, you know, the particular racism of the United States, they said, well, this is fine for Jews, but it will never work with black people in the United States. You're a bunch of communists. Um, so basically, in, in some ways, this was seen as too radical to be distributed. It did get sold a decent amount. It became sold in churches and civic groups. And if you read it, it's not, it's not, <laughs> one thing, it's not very radical. 
And as you can see from the cover, it kind of fits into traditional U.S. ideas about race. It doesn't even really, um, really adjust those very much. And so we end up in this peculiar position where, on the one hand, anthropologists were seen as too radical, too crazy, too out there for American society. But at the same time, they're basically traditionalists, you might say, in terms of the kinds of things they were espousing. They weren't that radical at all. And in some ways, you could argue they were, they were, not, they were not as radical as they could or should have been. And they were excluding people like Zora Neale Hurston and Du Bois, who had much more, much more interesting and radical ideas than they did. The third point is about how the Second World War was fought, who it was against. And um, I think it's just very important in this chapter to understand that the way the United States fought the Germans and the Italians in Europe was a lot different, at least in terms of the ideas and the way it was fought than, it, than the campaign in the Pacific against Japan. And as King says here, it's actually a little bit, a little bit painful to read, but, uh, in the year, so this is on page 320. The conflict in the Pacific was essentially different from the one in the European theater. Germany was a normal civilized society that had been overtaken by a devilish ideology and a barbaric dictator. Average Germans were in their way victims good people who had either been duped or subjugated by political elite bent on expansion and conquest. So that was the idea when we were fighting with the Germans. It wasn't that we were necessarily fighting the German people. We saw them as good people who were simply tricked. Maybe to a certain extent, the Italians too. The war against the Japanese, by contrast, was nothing less than a struggle for racial dominance. This is a quote from Ernie Pyle of celebrated journalist says, quote, in Europe, we felt that our enemies, horrible and deadly as they were, were still people. But out here, and he goes over the Pacific, but out here, I soon gathered that the Japanese were seen by American soldiers as something subhuman and repulsive. The way some people feel about cockroaches or mice which is a very different, which results in a, in, a, in a different way of thinking about the people who were in the United States as well. And so uh, in this chapter, we have a, a abbreviated account of some of the enormous internment camps that were set up in the United States where we put people, Japanese citizens uh, were interned uh, during the Second World War Actually, the uh, you know, blanking on his name. George Takei, Zulu from Star Trek was just over at SUNY talking about his book. He was actually in one of these camps as a, as a, a school child, wrote a book called They, they Called Us Enemy. Um, and then the ways in which the war was fought in the Pacific Islands and in Papua New Guinea, which many of these places, I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of crazy to think these were the places where the anthrop anthropology, like in the U.S. West, uh, international anthropology had had really been birthed. The Trobriand Islands and Malinowski and the Kula Ring, and Margaret Mead and. Bateson and, and Rayo Fortune all traipsing around in their weird love triangles and sex and temperament and uh, coming of age uh, stories. Um, this was where much of anthropology had been, had, had grown, had, had emerged. Uh, many of these places were then occupied by the Japanese and then saw some of the most brutal conflicts, the most grueling campaigns in 
World War II were fought in Papua New Guinea, uh, recruiting native peoples into both armies, uh, massive bombing campaigns like the world had never seen through some of these islands, just devastated. Um, and, you know, it's actually something we, we don't really uh, we don't really learn about too much unless you're kind of a war buff. But these places were the places of anthropology, and then anthropology just kind of went back like nothing had happened and filmed Unka's big mucka and stuff like that. And of course, then, you know, the the we tried out one atomic bomb and then we waited three days, the United States did and dropped another one. And I mean, one could say that, you know, it was okay to drop one because Japan wasn't going to surrender, but you could have waited a few more days before dropping the second one. Yeah, I haven't. Yeah, they didn't really know about the first one. They got the <laughs> it does say a lot. I mean, well, thank you for, yeah, thanks for that detail. Yeah, they could have. I guess I would have given him a week, you know. I mean, sure, these days, when we're, there's Twitter, they'd have to do something faster. But in the old days, you know, yeah, you could have given him a little, just a time to evaluate what was going on. Yeah. So there's that. Ruth Benedict at the time, uh, she then she plucked somebody out of the internment camp to talk to about Japanese society and wrote a book around the time called The Chrysanthemum and the Sword, which was meant to be sympathetic toward Japanese society and to portray them as actually human. And she did report to, to the army. There was this idea that the Japanese would would never surrender, and that if the if, even if the emperor said so, they they would never they would they would never respond. And Benedict said, "No, they will. They will. They they will. They will act. They will act rationally." And so, in that sense, she was on to something. This book was a pretty good seller in the United States, but what was kind of amazing is that it became a bestseller in Japan. And so it's perhaps the, I think the only book that sold better of an anthropologist who never went to Japan in its in its own in Japanese society. So that apparently at one point about a quarter of all Japanese people had read this book and would comment upon it. And so if you were ever doing anthropology in Japan, they'd be like, okay, what are you studying? What are you going to call your book? The Chrysanthemum and the car <laughs> you know so it became a kind of a kind of a national obsession um on the one hand of course this is again meant to be a sympathetic portrayal like we said a human portrayal of the people but it's also kind of locks them into a very traditional uh stereotype of uh of themselves so why does all this matter to us and in part, it matters, I think, because ethno-nationalism has come back. And I think that King, King wrote this book. He published it in uh, 2019, perhaps in, in the heyday of this. And he talks about how some Americans had taken to using shorthand acronyms, such as MIAFA for... My interests are for America. I know, Miafa. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. Sounds like some other acronym I've been hearing all these for the last few years. Actually, this other acronym stands for Spend Your Money with Americans Only. I can tell why this really didn't catch on too yeah. much. Yeah, they need to shorten it up a little bit, you know, make it make it more catchy. Fortunately, this isn't that catchy. This is actually a medallion from the Ku Klux Klan. So, yeah, <clears throat> I was trying to get one of these on eBay, but they 
sold out. Um, so as we may know, uh, this has not just happened in the United States. This has happened in other places as well. Italy just elected somebody who was, goes back to the old good old days, Brazil, Bolsonaro for a while, France had a flirtation, the big, actually the largest, the largest uh, uh, far right uh, members of parliament ever, Hungary, of course, Russia. Um, so this has been something that we're dealing with or, or has been resurging and we'll be, we'll be dealing with it for some time. And what to me is interesting is that in, in the times when, when King was writing, like Boaz was a really popular guy in terms of not that he was you know he was on the cover of time magazine and people were writing him to get him to sign these things to stop them from banning books in the schools and stuff like that and benedict was well known mead of course was super well known and they were big sellers uh big lecturers very much in demand i don't know any anthropology people like that i can't think of anybody and in fact, I think it's so it's so much so that to me, I think we don't e I we don't even remember that anthropology was important, that they 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 were as vocal and popularizing as they were. And it took this person who wasn't even an anthropologist, Carl Charles King, who was a professor of some other thing like international relations or something to write a book about the importance of this subject. So it's, you know, it hasn't been completely for lack of trying. Like anthropology came out with this magazine called Anthropology Now. <laughs> Why, huh? You do? Wow. Oh. Magazines are fun. Have you ever read this one? Yes. Why? <laughs> Apparently, I'm a weird kid. All right. Anybody else ever seen this? Wow. I didn't think anybody would have read this. One of my friends is a is is a new book editor from that and. She asked me if I wanted to review this book for Anthropology Now and really get it out there. Like, only Liam will read it. I don't know. Is that going to do anything? Aha, yeah, it's over there. It's over there in Massachusetts. They're strange there. So I haven't decided. I mean, this book did get reviewed in a lot of different places back in 2019, like the New York Times, the New Yorker, Washington Post. So I haven't I haven't decided what to what to really say about that. But I do know that it, this is not, except for Liam, it's not not reaching the same kind of mass audiences that we once thought about. The closest thing I think that we have to a bestseller in anthropology right now is this book, which I've talked about a little bit before with you, The Dawn of Everything, New History of Humanity, 